Christ. Amen. The sermon text for today is our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And please rise as we hear these words again in Jesus' name. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And we pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. You may be seated. These verses begin by telling us that the Annunciation took place in the sixth month. This sixth month is not a reference to the sixth month of our calendar or to the Jewish calendar. Rather, this mention of the sixth month points us back to something the angel Gabriel had done six months before this, when he also came to Zechariah the priest and said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. That baby, whom God gave to Zechariah and Elizabeth, even though they were both well past childbearing age, was John the Baptist. Now in both these cases, the angel Gabriel was announcing something that God was going to do that was humanly impossible. The Virgin Mary was a virgin, while her relative Elizabeth was the senior citizen. So both these birds fall clearly into the camp of miracles. But of course, even though both of these births were miraculous, there were some differences. The baby who was born to Elizabeth and Zechariah was Zechariah's son. The two of them acted in a normal husband and wife way, and even though God had not done so before this, he blessed them with a son. Both Elizabeth and Zechariah were John the Baptist's parents in every single way. Mary, on the other hand, didn't have a husband. She had a fiancé, but the two of them had not yet become or acted like husband and wife. What this means is that even though the birth of John the Baptist was a miracle, the birth of Christ was an even greater miracle. Unlike John, Jesus did not have a biological human father. He was conceived and born as a half-orphan who needed Joseph to be his stepfather. So as little as there was that was normal about the birth of John the Baptist, there wasn't anything normal about Jesus' birth. This is why when both Zechariah and Mary heard what the angel Gabriel told them, they wanted to know how this was possible. But you'll notice that when Mary asked this question, she did not reject what the angel was telling her. Instead, Mary just wanted more information. She believed that God could do this. She was just curious how he was going to do it. But Zechariah wasn't curious. When the angel Gabriel told him that his wife was going to have a baby, Zechariah replied, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. In other words, what you are telling me is impossible, because my wife and I are too old. 
Zechariah's doubt in the face of this great gift from God was why God chastised Zechariah with muteness until after his son was born. But maybe you're thinking that this wasn't fair. Because in our minds, Zechariah and Mary essentially said the same thing. But they didn't. Zechariah said, how shall I know this? While Mary said, how will this be? Mary was asking how what the angel was telling her would happen. Zechariah wanted to know how what the angel was telling him was something that he could possibly accept to be true. This was why Mary was not chastised when she asked how this was going to happen. Mary trusted that, God, that what God was telling her through the angel was true. Let's take a step back from Mary and Zechariah and consider how we react when we encounter things in the Bible that might seem to be impossible. For starters, there is nothing in the Bible that is not 100% true. Not only does God's word determine what is true for us spiritually, but it also determines what is true for us in every aspect of our lives. We read in Genesis chapter 1 that God spoke the entire universe into existence. It didn't create itself. It didn't gradually take shape over millions or billions of years. God created it with words in six normal length days. We also read in the Gospels and in the Epistles that the washing of holy baptism and the meal of Christ's body and blood are not merely symbolic. In baptism, by the power of his word, which he has attached to it, God really does wash away our sins and give us faith. And in the supper, along with a little piece of bread and sip of wine, again, by the power of God's word, we receive the very same body and blood that was hung and shed on the cross to make possible the forgiveness of all our sins. But when we read or hear these declarations from God or others like them, do we react like Mary or Zechariah? Do we ask, piously, believing in God, how this is true? Or do we ask, impiously, doubting God, how what he says can be true? <coughs> Prove it, God, because what I sense and have been told disagrees with what you're telling me. But instead of doubting God, when he tells us things that we cannot completely wrap our minds around, maybe we should remember what the angel Gabriel told Mary. That message of the virgin conception and birth of Christ was completely impossible. It was something certainly we had never seen in our lives. But is that miracle something we want to doubt? Do we want to limit in any way God's ability to save us from sin and death by telling God he's not allowed to do things that are not part of our life experiences? Of course we don't want to do that. We don't want to limit God in that or any way because we believe in God. We have benefited from that which his eternally begotten, miraculously conceived son did for us. For the 33 sinless years of his life, and then that one day when he suffered and died innocently on the cross. If we doubt God's miracles in the Bible, then we also have to doubt God's miracles in our lives. And no, I'm not talking about us walking on water or having the strength of Samson. I'm talking about us believing in God. I'm talking about the miracle God has worked where we are no longer his enemies who are doomed to die in our sins, but that we are his children, whom he loves, whose sins he has forgiven, and to whom he has given the future reality of the resurrection and eternal life. It is not only improper, but also very self-defeating for us to doubt what God tells us. This kind of doubt may give us the temporary satisfaction of thinking that we have complete control over what we know and believe to be true. But do you, as a sinful human being, want to have this control? Do you want to think that God can only do things that you have seen and can understand for yourself? I know that I don't, and I don't think that you do either. For us to be saved, we need God to intervene into the normal human condition. We need Him to do things that are beyond our senses and reason. 
We need him to reach down both in history and right now in our lives to perform the miracle of forgiveness and salvation. This is honestly the biggest thing that we should take away from today's observance of the Annunciation of our Lord. Our friends in other denominations have made quite a big to-do about Mary. Some say that she was perfect, that she was a saint in her own right. But Mary wasn't. Just like her husband Joseph, Mary was not someone who was somehow removed from needing to believe in God and trust in his ability to do things that are nothing short of miraculous. The greatest thing about Mary is also the greatest thing about us. Mary believed in God. She trusted in his promises and in his ability to keep those promises. Mary had this ability to trust God because God had given it to her, just like he has given it to us. Mary had this ability to trust God even when he told her things that would normally be impossible. And even when he had told her things that would require her to make great sacrifices, because God had forgiven Mary of all her sins, and he had given her the confidence of faith that only he can give. And even when Mary wanted to know how God would do what he said he would do, she did not stop trusting God. She knew and believed with all her heart that even before this, God had given her faith and forgiveness. He had favored her before he gave her this special job. But we can't forget that what the angel told Mary was something that was hard for her to do. None of us who are parents like to see our kids fall off their bikes or scuff their knees. We put gates at the top of our stairs in our homes to make sure our kids fall down, don't fall down because the thought of that is horrifying to us. Mary had to see something happen to her son that was far, far worse than him falling down a hundred sets of stairs. She had to see him crucified and killed. We read in the Gospels that at the end of Jesus' life, even when all but one of his disciples had abandoned him, Mary was there with her son, loving him, seeing him suffer and die in payment for her sins and for the sins of the whole world. Mary believed in Jesus. She knew why he had to do this. But that does not at all diminish the fact that the man whom she saw dying on the cross was the same one whom she had nursed when he was a baby and cuddled when he was a toddler and whose hand she had held as she walked him to his first day of school. It was harder for Mary to see this than it would have been for us to, because she was his mother and we weren't. Mary was not saved any more by Jesus because of this. But still, we today are personally grateful to Mary for the pain she had to endure as a result of Jesus' atoning death on the cross. God tells us in his word that he has accomplished our salvation. God tells us how he has done this, both historically on the cross and from the empty tomb, and now in our lives by giving us all the benefits of Jesus' death and resurrection in the means of grace. In his word, God also tells us that in bringing about our salvation, he has worked through certain people whom he chose for this purpose. These past two weeks at Hope, we have been focusing on Jesus' mother and stepfather. These two people, these Christians, heard and believed and then were willing to act on God's word. They were willing to make the great personal sacrifices that God asked of them. Both Mary and Joseph were willing to be poorly thought of because people naturally assumed they had jumped the gun on the benefits of marriage. And Mary especially after raising Jesus as her own son, because he was her own son. She watched her own son willingly suffer and die in the worst way imaginable in the place of sinners. Just because we only worship God and only trust in him and his word for our forgiveness and salvation, doesn't mean that we don't also admire the saints who have come before us. We don't learn from them in the sense that we copy their lives to save ourselves. 
Mary and Joseph would be horrified if they didn't be thought about them that way. Rather, we do learn from them and we admire them because of their example of faith. They relied on God. They only trusted in Him and His Word for their forgiveness and salvation. May we always faithfully follow in their footsteps and joyfully say with Mary, no matter what God asks of us, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We now continue with the offertory.